Having an accurate knowledge of Earth history requires that we correctly interpret the geology of the world, but is the interpretation we're taught in school correct? When looking at this subject, it is important to recognize that we're only taught an interpretation of scientific findings, not facts. Interpretations of observations that stem from the scientist worldview. I assert to you today that the biblical flood was a real historical event and the geology of this, this event has been misinterpreted by the scientific community. The Bible describes a terrible event brought by God due to the sin that was on the earth in those days. This event, this uh, global flood, is described in Genesis. There's a couple of points for consideration, though, that I want to make here. One, again, it was a global scale event. And two, that no land animal or man was able to survive this event. Those two points are made very emphatically by the text. Let's read it. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man. Everything on dry land whose nostrils of the breath of life died. Well, this was a terribly destructive and global scale event that no land animal or human was able to survive on their own. The book of Genesis is clear on this point. <clears throat> terrestrial life only exists because they were saved from this event through an act of supernatural intervention, meaning Noah's flood. God told Noah there was going to be a flood, told him how to build the ark. That's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It was three stories tall and the length of one and a half football fields. And the animals came to Noah to be kept alive. Look at that. It says that specifically in the text. The Noah's came to him to be left alive to be kept alive. Well, let me ask you one uh, very important question, and that's this. If there had been an event like the one described in Genesis, what else would we expect to find than what we actually find? We live on a flood wasteland. The evidence of this event is monumental. It is everywhere we look. The world is covered in sedimentary rock layers that are hundreds of feet thick, laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals. However, when we consider the extent of the flood described in the Bible, that it was global and that life was saved from this event through an act of supernatural intervention, it should not be hard to understand that the physical findings of the event could not be correctly interpreted without some very special insights. Some insights, ladies and gentlemen, which the scientific community does not have, like the insights we have through God's Word. But most scientists are operating with any flawed worldview. Therefore, we should be very skeptical about what's being taught today as science, in particular about ancient earth history and origins. Much of scientific inquiry today is based on an atheistic worldview, the belief that there is no God. When athe this view of, about, of atheism is applied to the world around us, this is what's led to naturalism, or what we call philosophical naturalism. The view that all physical phenomena must be explained as happening through purely natural processes, and that the origin of everything, the earth and life on earth, etc., must have occurred through purely natural processes. This is the position that has been adopted by the scientific community. This is why scientists Scientists refer to it as naturalists, why our science museums are fre frequently called natural history museums, and why the world around us is called nature. Today, it is argued that you cannot even be a scientist or practice science without holding to this view we call naturalism. Well, when the philosophical naturalism was applied to the world around us, this is where uniformitarianism was birthed. Around 1850, a new view began to develop that argued that slow and gradual processes with uniform rates of erosion and uh, uh, uniform rates of intensities uh, were responsible for Earth's geological features, features like fossiliferous, fossiliferous rock and erosion features. This view became known as uniformitarianism. However, prior to the 19th century, it was largely assumed by geologists that catastrophes, most notably the biblical flood, was responsible for the majority of these features. The concept of uniformitarianism was ushered in by two champions of a natural science of geology, James Hutton and Charles Lyell. James Hutton, shown here, was an anti-catastrophist who argued in his 1785 book titled The Theory of the Earth for uniformity, uniformity of causes to explain, explain Earth's geologic features. He asserted that sedimentary rock layers are the result of cyclic processes of erosion and sediment deposition. Processes he argued do not change over time. 
With this in mind, let's read a prophecy from 2 Peter. Now, it is prophesied here, they say, knowing, in, knowing this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following their own passions and lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues, just as it was from the beginning of creation. This is, that is the prophesied view that forms the basis of uniformitarianism, that all continues just as it was from the beginning. Now let's read on. When they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens, heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by, the, and by water, through which the world at that time was deluged, being flooded with water. It states, note that it states, that their, uh, that their worldview causes them to be willfully ignorant of this fact, as it also reads, or as the ESV reads, they deliberately ignore, overlook this fact, that the world was flooded with water. Interesting that. Well, in 1830, Charles Lyell argued in his book titled Principle of Geology for Uniformity of Intensity. He asserted that the same gradual processes occurring today were responsible for all geologic features. He summarized this in the oft-quoted saying, the present is the key to the past. Lyell wrote in his in an 1830 letter to George Scrope that his agenda, about his agenda to free the science from Moses. He also heavily influenced Charles Darwin, who was said to have had a copy of his book with him on, on uh, his famous voyage on the HMS Beagle. Well, these two views we call catastrophism and uniformitarianism De debate the question of whether sedimentary rocks, like the sandstone you see here, originate by slow and gradual processes of transport or catastrophic flooding. Now understand that the rocks in this area that you see here are new. Uh, this is sandstone. Sand was transported to this area as sediments that were originally accumulated to the tops of these monuments that you see here in Monument Valley, Utah. Then subsequent erosion removed all the sand that is now missing. Did the sandstone that is now missing erode away slowly at uniform rates or catastrophically? This is the debate. The fact is that the geology of this event cannot be interpreted correctly by secular science because of their adherence to naturalism. This was an event that nothing could survive naturally. A person holding to rigid philosophical naturalism simply cannot correctly interpret the geology of an event such as this. There was a global scale catastrophe in the distant past that nothing could survive. And yet today life exists. Lots of life, fragile life, lots of delicate little creatures that would be completely unable to survive an event capable of laying down such deposits. And yet running around on top of these vast layers of rocks, there they are those fragile little creatures. This supernatural intervention altered the otherwise certain natural outcome of the event, the death of all terrestrial life. Preventing this natural outcome precludes or prevents a correct interpretation of the earth's geology by a naturalist. To a naturalist, there's only one possible interpretation. These layers of sediments had to form slowly and gradually at, at a rate or in a manner that life could have survived without assistance meaning naturally. Well, as a result of adopting uniformitarianism, most secular geologists today are highly biased against flood catastrophe as an explanatory mechanism of the Earth's geologic features. This bias is well illustrated by the story of Hardin Bretz. Harlan Bretz was a geologist in, in the 1920s who uh, proposed that features in eastern Washington must have been formed by a large-scale flooding of catastrophic proportions. He named this area of eastern Washington the Channeled Scablands, where there are found channels like this eroded through solid volcanic rock in an area that sees very little moisture. Massive features can be found, such as these coolies. The Grand Coulee, shown here, reaches four miles wide and 900 feet deep. Well, Hart and Brett's asserted that for the, these coolies to form, they must have been completely filled with water at one point in time because they have very flat bottoms and very straight sides. The flood he was proposing to account for these features was monumental. As you can see from this map, in the area in question is vast where the channels and coolies can be found. 
a good 120 miles across. The light blue shown here is where these features are found, these channels and coolies. And the dark water, the dark blue is where water is found there today. The channels are so deep, deeply cut through, again, solid volcanic rock that they are visible from satellite photos, as shown here. However, the geologic community initially thought the hypothesis of Brett's was outrageous and refused the idea of catastrophic flooding because most geologists side by the principles of uniformitarianism. Although the Scablam features display an obvious witness to a major catastrophic flood, Harlan Bretz was subject to scorn for the suggestion due to the strong bias that geologists have against catastrophic flood interpretations of geology. An article that was published in the Seattle Times uh, in 2003 speaks to the plight that Harlan Bretz went through. Mystified by the forces that could have exposed such massive features, Bretz set out in the early 20s to solve the riddle. He returned with a hypothesis that was dismissed as near lunacy, craziness. In a region that sees less moisture in a year than Seattle gets in a month, Bretts concluded that the entire landscape was carved by water. Bretts, according to some reports, was quickly isolated as a crank, a crazy person, while his critics' theories continued to make it into textbooks. Fifty years later, Bretts was hailed as a hero, and in 1979, at the age of 96, he was given geology's highest honor, the Penrose Medal, which rewards one researcher each year for exceptional contribution to, to geology. Two years later, he passed away. Well, today it is well recognized that the Channel Scablands was caused by a major catastrophic flood called the Missoula Flood, a massive Ice Age lake that was blocked from drainage, eventually ruptured its dam, and a 3,000 square mile lake centered around Missoula, Montana, then plowed across Washington in about two days, destroying and reshaping the U.S. landscape from Montana to the Pacific Ocean. Many of the large scab land features cannot be identified while standing on the ground, which is part of the problem. Several were only discovered after field researchers observed them from airplanes. Only from, air, from the air are the rolling hills west of Spokane shown here identified as act being actually giant ripple marks similar to those seen on a beach or at a lakeshore. But these hills are up to 30 feet high and 250 feet apart. The Missoula Flood carved out the Columbia River Gorge. It was responsible for creating the Columbia River Gorge. The flood transported tons of material from eastern Washington all the way down to the Willamette Valley, including large boulders that can be found there called erratics. The area where Portland stands today was completely underwater. Flood waters there were 400 feet deep, it is estimated, and traveling at 90 miles per hour and were equal to what is found in all the Earth's rivers today, actually 10 times what is found in all the Earth's rivers today were present at the Missoula Flood. Well, it also formed a massive waterfall um, where there is today a Dry Falls State Park and Visitor Center. The massive waterfall is uh, visualized with the help of an artist uh, reconstruction there on the railing at the over overlook of the Dry Falls. It was a massive waterfall, though, to uh, try to get the scale for you here. This video may help. The Niagara Falls, by comparison, is only one mile wide, one mile wide, and drops 165 feet. The waterfall that was present during this flood at the Dry Falls Visitor Center, where this big uh, cliff face you can see there, was three times the size of Niagara Falls. It was three and a half miles wide with a 400, 400 foot drop. Well, if you go to Dry Falls, look around for this, if you go to the Dry Falls Visitor Center, look around for this plaque. Because in 1994, the Dry Falls Visitor Center was dedicated to Harlan Bretz. Uh, this plaque can be found there. It reads, dedicated to Harlan Bretz, who patiently taught us that catastrophic floods may sometimes play a role in nature's unfolding drama. And a quote from Harlan Bretz is found there. He said, ideas without precedent are generally looked upon with disfavor, and men are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. Well, it took geologists 50 years to acknowledge that the geologic features in eastern Washington were the result of catastrophic flooding. This bias against catastrophism in geology is obviously driven by the biblical narrative of Noah's flood. 
which in this case prevented the whole of the geologic community from correctly interpreting features that are otherwise fairly easy to recognize. Due to the ever-present influence of naturalism, we should be very skeptical about what science is teaching today, and particularly about ancient Earth history and origins. The Missoula Flood escaped their notice because of their worldview, just as it says in 2 Peter 3-6. through And they are certainly going to deliberately overlook the fact that the entire geologic record, like you see here, is due to a global flood. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a global flood, and the fossil record is a monumental evidence of this event. Interpreting it otherwise has devastating consequences because of what these stones mean. Ladies and gentlemen, these stones are and were meant to always be an everlasting reminder of God's hatred of sin and his judgment that came in the past. A judgment that we're supposed to remember. Jesus reminded us that in the latter judgment, things will come just as they did in the first. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Well, just as God provided Noah a way to be saved from the coming judgment, so he has provided us a way too, through his son Jesus. All he asks is that we repent of the sin that's in our life, sin that is separating us from God, and ask for forgiveness. Jesus has already paid the penalty for that sin for us.